I'm actually reading Nora Roberts' book, Sea Swept, Chapter 17. He was watching for her. Can't figure it was just one more first in his life. He never watched and waited for a woman that he could recall. Even as a teenager, they had come to him, calling on the phone, wandering by the house, Lord Nair's locker at school. He supposed he'd gotten used to it, spoiled by it. He had never faced the typical male terror of asking for the first date. He'd been asked out when he was 15 by the illustrious Allison Burnett and an older woman, an older woman of 16. She even picked him up at his front door and her daddy, 72 Chevy Impala. He wasn't sure how he felt about being driven around by a girl till Allison had parked on Blue Crab Drive, suggested they make use of the back seat. He didn't mind that a bit. Losing his virginity to pretty, fast-handed Allison at 15 was a sweaty and delightful experience, and Cam had never looked back. He liked women, liked everything about them, even the knowing parts it was what made them female. He figured men got the best part of the deal. They got to look. They got to touch and smell. Unless they were de unless they were complete morons, they could usually wiggle out of those soft arms and move on to the next ones without too much trouble. He never been a moron, but he watched for Anna and waited for her and wondered what it was about her that made him not quite so anxious to wiggle. Maybe it was a lack of presence pressure. He mused as he wandered away from the dock toward the side of the house to listen for a car. Again, it could be the very lack of any expectation. She was joyfully sexual. She didn't seem to export, expect a lot of romantic trappings. She'd come from a painful childhood, yet she'd gotten past the damage, made herself into something strong and whole. He admired that. The way she could and did play up or play down, her looks fascinated him. That du duality kept him wondering who she would be, and yet both parts of her fit so smoothly together. A man could barely see the seam. The more he thought about her, the more he wanted her. What are you doing? He nearly jumped out of his skin when Seth came up behind him. He'd been staring at the road, all but went up Anna to pull him to the drive. Now he jammed his hands in his pockets, mortified. Nothing. Just walking around. You weren't walking, Seth pointed out, because I'd stopped. Now I'm walking again. See? Seth rolled his eyes and came back and caught up with him. What am I supposed to do? <sighs> Can't finish in tense interest in the candy red tulips. Sunning themselves along the edge of the house. About what? Stuff. Ethan's out on the work boat, and Phillips closed up in the office doing computer stuff. So? He leaned down to tug up a weed. At least he thought it was weed. Where the hell was she? Where, where are those kids you've been hanging with? They had to go to the store and have lunch with his grandmother. Says so sneered on principle. I don't have anything to do. It's boring. We'll go clean the room or something. Come on. Jesus, what am I? Your social director? Is the TV broken? Nothing on Saturday mornings but a kid shit. You are a kid. Can't point it out. Heard the sound of an approaching car with vast relief. Teach that brain dead dog of yours some tricks. He's not brain dead. Instantly insulted, Seth turned and whistled for the pup. Watch. Fullest raced up, carrying what appeared to be a can of beer in his mouth. Yeah, chewing on a lunar man. That's brilliant. Look, I don't. But Cam broke off when Seth snapped the finger. Pointed, Phyllis plopped his butt on the ground. He does it on voice command, too. So, said matter of factly, as he rubbed Phyllis, she said in reward. But if God him responded to hand signals, he held a hand out, and Phyllis gamingly lifted a paw. That's pretty good. Pride and surprise smacked in his voice. How long did it take you to teach him that? Just a couple of hours here and there. All three watched as Anna pulled into the drive. Phyllis was the first to rush the greeter. He doesn't do real good with stay yet, <laughs> Seth, come on. Well, we haven't worked on it long. He doesn't do real good with down, either. Anna stepped out of the car. Foolish was leaping and yipping, his tongue lashing out joyfully to lick everywhere. Can't figure the dog had the right idea. He'd have liked to jump on her and start licking himself. She wore jeans that were faded to a soft, pale blue and a lipstick red top top. Lipstick red top tucked into the waistband with a simple outfit that borrowed from the practical in the siren. <laughs> I mean, it came to mouth water. She looks different with her hair down. Seth come on. Yeah, he wanted his hands on it, on her, and that was that. She crouched down, purred at the puppy, who had flopped adorably on his back to have his belly rub. Her head came up, and even with the shaving glasses, came to see her eyes widen in awareness, then shift warmly, warmly to the child who walked behind her, ignoring the signal. He hauled her up to her feet, gave her one good yank, 
that made her stumble over the pup and against him and close his mouth over her sputtering protests. It was like being swallowed by the sun. It was all she could think. The heat was huge, and he had reached flash point before she could draw the first breath. Need, restless and greedy, pumped out of him and slammed into her at an alarming speed. The wild drumming of a woodpecker, hunting breakfast, echoed through the still air and matched the frantic beat of her heart. All she could do was hold on until he devoured enough of what he wanted from her to satisfy him. When he eased her back, those clever lips curved, smug look. She was sure she would resent when he, her head settled back on her shoulders again. Morning, Anna. Good morning. She cleared her throat, sat back, and made herself look over her set. He appeared to be more bored than shocked, so she worked up a smile for him. Good morning, Seth. Yeah, hi. Your dog's growing into his feet. Because she needed the distraction, Luke, down a foolish, held on a hand. He planted his rump and looked at her paw, charming her. Oh, aren't you smart? She crouched again, shook his paw, tugged his ear. What else can you do? Uh, we're working on a couple things. Foolish had just run through his entire repertoire, but Seth didn't want to say so. You make a good team. I've got groceries in the car, she said casually. Make things for dinner. Give me a hand. Yeah, all right. He shot a resentful look at him. Got nothing else to do. We're going sailing, aren't we? She said it brightly, amused when she saw Cam's mouth fall open. So, look at her with sharp, interested eyes. Am I going? Of course. She started opening the car door, then handed him a bag. As soon as we put this stuff away, I hope I'm a quick learner. I know next to nothing about boats. Cheered, set settled bags on his e trip. Nothing to it, but you should have a hat. With this, he carried his bags toward the house. I was figuring on a being just you and me. Cam told her he had a nice fantasy going about slipping into some quiet bend of the river, making rocky love, turning to the bottom of the boat. Where are you? She took a small overnight bag, pushing it in his hands. I'm sure it'll be great fun with the three of us. She closed her car door, patted Cam's sheet, then sauteed into the house behind Seth. Turned out to be the four of them. Seth insisted on taking foolish, and when Anna backing him all the way, they outvoted Cam. It was tough to stay annoyed when his crew was so damn cheerful. Foolish sat on a bench, wearing an ancient doggy life jacket that had belonged to one of Ray and Stella's numerous dogs, and barked happily at waves and birds. Seth, already munching on one of the sandwiches from the cooler, dutifully explained to Anna the mystery of rigging. She looked so damn cute, Cam stopped with one of his old... <laughs> Old and battered Oreos caps on her head, watching studiously as Seth identified each line. He moved her through the channels, monitoring between markers and at an easy speed, working through what the locals called Little Neck River and the Tendula Sound and toward the bay. There was a light chop, and came glanced back to see how Anna would weather it. She was kneeling in the stern, leaning over the rail, but he saw with a grin that... But he saw with a grin that it wasn't because of a queasy stomach. Her smile was huge, her finger pointed eagerly as she caught sight of the clumps of trees and spreading marshes of Smith Island. He called for Seth to hoist sail. It was a moment Anna would never forget. City life hadn't prepared her for the sounds, the motion, the sight of white sails rising, snapping in the wind, and filling with it. For a moment, the boat seemed to fly, with the wind slapping her cheeks and filling the canvases to bursting. Water churned in their wake, and she tasted salt. She wanted to wash everything at once. The waves rising from blue-green water, sea of white canvases above, the stretches and bumps of land, and the man and boy who worked so smoothly, so com competently with barely a word passing between them the sail passed what set identified as crab shanky it was no more than a fragile shack of beaten and weather gray wood slitted out of the water and attached to a rickety dock the orange floats that marked the crab pots dotted the surface she watched a work boat rocking in the tide as a waterman picturing his faded pants battered cap and white boots hauled up chicken wire to cage he paused in his work long enough to touch the rim of his cap in greeting before tossing two snapping crabs into his water tank. Life on the water, Anna thought, and watched the work boat put, put toward the next float. That's little Donnie, said Thorin. Ethan says they call him that, even though he's grown up because his father's big Donnie. Weird, Anna laughed, and looked to her as if little Donnie was pushed 200 pounds. I guess that's the way it is when you live in a small community. Must be wonderful to live and work on the water that way, said Levitle. It's okay, but I'd rather just sail. When she lifted her face in the wind, she decided he had a point. Just sail. 
fast and free, with the boat rising and falling, the gulls wheeling overhead. Camp looked so natural at the wheel, she thought with his long legs part, his long legs planted apart to accommodate the roll of the boat, his hands firm, his dark hair flying. When he turned his head, was it any wonder her heart jumped when he held out a hand? Was it any wonder she rose, walked cautiously over the unfamiliar deck to take it? On the wheel. Desperately? Better not, she said, trying to be proud. I don't know what I'm doing. I do. He tugged her in front of him, put his hands over hers. That's Pokemo. He told her not toward a narrow channel. If you want her to slow down, we can head that way. Dodge some crab pots. The wind slapped playfully at her face. She watched the gold sweep toward the surface of the water, skimmed it, then rise up, calling it that sharp cry that sounded like a laughing scream. The hell with practicalities. I don't want to slow down. She heard him laugh above her. At a girl. Where are we heading? What are we doing? Heading south, southeast, southwest. Sound to the left. He told her. On the edge of the wind. On the edge? It feels like we're in the middle of it. I didn't know we could go so fast. It's wonderful. Good. Hold on a minute. To her shock, he stepped back and called the set to help him make some adjustments to the sails. As her hands white knuckled on the wheel, she heard them laughing. She heard the creak of the mast, the shiver of the canvas as it turned. If anything, she thought the boat picked up speed. She tried to relax. After all, there was nothing but water ahead of them. She could see to the right. Starbird, she corrected herself. A small motorboat cru cruising out of one of the many rivers and channels. Too far away, she judged for any traffic jams or accidents. Just as she had herself convinced she could do the job without incident, the boat tilted. She muffled a scream, nearly whipped the wheel in the opposite direction of the tilt. McGam's hands closed over hers again. Held her steady. We're going over. <laughs> nah, we're healed in nicely. More speed. Her heart stayed in her throat. You left me at the wheel. The hills need a trimming. The kid knows how to work the sheets. He's inside them a lot. He catches on quick. He's a damn good sailor. But you left me at the wheel, she repeated. You did fine. <laughs> Rushing after kissing on top of her head. That's Tangela Island up ahead. We'll go around it, then head north. There's some quiet spots on the little chop tank. We'll hit there about lunchtime. They didn't appear to be capsizing. She thought with a steady breath, since she hadn't run him aground, she relaxed and up, leaned back against him. She planted her feet apart as Cam did, let her body balance with the motion of the boat. Her newest ambition was to have a little soap, skiff, whatever it was called, which we finally got that house on the water. She would have the Quinn brothers build it for her. She decided dreamily, if I had a boat. I do this every chance I got. We'll have to teach you the basics before long. We'll have you trapezing. What? Singing from the mask and a spangled leotard? Him in which had its appeal. Not quite. You use a, you use a rig, a trapeze, and you hang out over the water. For fun? Oh, I like it. He said with a laugh. It's for speed, miles, and power. Hanging out over the water. She moves glances to port. I might like it too. He let her work the jib under Seth's watchful eye. She liked the feel of the line in her hand and knowing she was in charge, more or less, of the billowing white sheet. They rounded the little sandy spit of Tangler Island, and she retreated to the quick maneuvering of tacking, jibbing, the teamwork necessary to maintain speed while changing course. Cam had stripped down to denim cutoffs, and his skin gleamed with sun and sweat and water. Her hands ached a little from the unfamiliar work. She didn't complain. Instead, she got a foolish thrill when Cam told her she was a pretty good. She was told her she was a pretty good crew. They had lunch on Hudson Creek up the little Comtock River near Broken Down Wharf with only the birds in the lap of water for company. The sun was bright in clear blue sky and the temperature had soared into the 80s to give a hint of the summer that was still weeks away. To the accompaniment of music on the radio, they took a cooling swim. Foolish paddled joyfully with Seth, dived beneath the mirror-like surface and swam like a wild dolphin. He's having the time of his life, Emma murdered. A layer of the sulky, defiant, angry boy she'd first interviewed was being washed away. She wondered if he knew it. Then I guess I can't be too annoyed that you insisted on his coming along. She smiled. She wanted her hair up on top of her head in a vain attempt to keep it dry. With the way Seth and the puppy were splashing, nothing was dry. You don't really mind, and you never have had that smooth of a sail without him on board. True enough. Well, there's something to be said for a rough sail. He parted the water in front of him. Then slid his arms around her. Anna gripped his shoulders in automatic defense. No donkey. <laughs> Would I do anything that predictable? 
His eyes were smoky with laughter, especially when this is much more fun. He tilted his head and kissed her. Their lips were wet and slippery, and Anna's pulse thrummed at the sensation of his mouth sliding over hers. Then captured, then taking. The cool water seemed to grow warmer as her legs tingled. She was weightless, sighing as she floated into the kiss. Then she was underwater, surface fluttering, shaking wet hair out of her eyes. First thing she heard was Seth's laughter. First thing she saw was Cam's grin. It was irresistible, he claimed, and swallowed water himself as she flipped onto her stomach. He kicked him in the face! You're next, she warned Seth, who was so stunned at the idea of an adult playing with him that she caught him easily, wrestled him under. He struggled, spat out water, swallowed more, and when he laughed, hey, I didn't do anything. He laughed. Besides, as I see it, you guys work as a team. It was probably your idea. No way, he wiggled free, and got the bright idea to dive and pull her under the surface by an ankle. It was a pitched battle, and when they were exhausted, they agreed to call it a draw. It was only then that they noticed Cam was no longer in the water, but was sitting comfortably on the side of the boat eating a sandwich. What are you doing up there? Anna called out while she pushed her soft, sobbing wet hat. Watching the show. He washed the ham and cheese down with a Pepsi. A couple of goons. Goons? She slid her eyes towards Seth and attacked in agreement. The foes became a unit. I only see one goon around here. How about you? Just one, he agreed. They swam slowly toward the boat. An idiot could have seen what they had in mind. Cam nearly lifted his legs out of reach. Then he decided what the hell. Let them pull him back into the water with an impressive splash. It would be hours before it occurred to Seth that Anna and Cam both had their hands on him, and he hadn't been scared at all. After the boat was docked and the sails drooped, Dropped the deck swabbed, Anna rolled up her metaphorical sleeves and got to work in the kitchen. It was her mission to give the Quinn men a meal they wouldn't soon forget. She might have been a novice sailor, but here she was an expert. It smells like glory, Philip told her when he wandered in. It tastes better, she built the layers of her lasagna with an artistic flair. Old family recipe. They're the best, he agreed. We've got my father's secret waffle batter recipe. I'll have to whip you up some in the morning. I'd like that. She glanced up to smile at him and noted what she thought was worried in his eyes. Everything all right? Sure. Just some leftover tangles from work. It had nothing to do with work, but with the latest report from the private investigator, he hired says mother had been spotted in Norfolk. And that was entirely too close. I need any help in here. Everything's under control. She finished off her casserole. Within layer of mozzarella before popping it in the oven. You might want to try that wine. Absently, Philip picked up the bottle, breathing in, breathing on the counter, and instantly his interest would be Nebello, the best of the Italian reds. I think so, and I can promise my lasagnas a match for it. Philip grinned as he poured two glasses. His eyes were golden brown that for some reason made Anna think of archangels. And my love, why don't you toss Cam over and run away with me? Because I'd, because I'd hunt you both down and kill you. Can't say that as he stepped into the kitchen. Back off from my woman, bro, before it hurts you. Though it was said lightly, Cam wasn't exactly sure he was joking. He wasn't entirely pleased full of a little spurt of jealousy. He wasn't a jealous type. He doesn't know a Barlow from a Chintini. Philip told her as he got down another glass. You're better off with me. Goodness, he said it a Passable in for intimidation of their below the Mason Dixon line draw. I just love being fought over by strong men, and here comes one more. She added as Ethan stepped through the back door. You want to do it for me too, Ethan? He blinked and scratched his head. When we confused him, but he was pretty sure there was a joke coming on. Did you make what's ever cooking in there? With my own little hands, he said. I'll go get my gun. When she laughed, she got her a quick smile. The duck out of the room to shower off the day's work. Jesus, Jesus, Ethan nearly flirted with a woman. A maze Philip lifted his glass and said, We're going to have to keep you around, Anna. If someone was at the table, when I put the salad together, I might hang around long enough to let you sample my cannoli. Cam and Philip eyed each other. Whose darn is it? Cam demanded. Not mine. It must be yours. No way. I did it yesterday. They studied each other another moment. Then both turned to the door and yelled for Seth. Anna only shook her head. Younger brothers, she supposed, were meant to be abused in such manners. 
She knew the meal was a success when Seth gobbled up a third helping. He lost that alley cat boneness, she noted, in the pallor. Perhaps his eyes were still occasionally weary, peeking out under his lashes as if searching for the blow that he learned too young to expect. But more often, Anna thought there was humor in his eyes. He was a bright boy who was discovering how to be amused by people. His language was rough. She didn't expect there would be a great deal of improvement in, in it as long as he lived in a house full of men, though she did see that Cam booted him lightly under the table now and again when he swore too often. They were making it work. She had strong doubts in the beginning that three grown men will set in their ways would find a way of adjusting, of making room and especially of opening hearts to a boy who had been trust, thrust upon them. But they were making it work. When she wrote her report on the Quinn case the following week, she was going to state that Seth the Lochner was home, exactly where he belonged. It would take time for the guardianship to move from temporary to permanent, but she would add her weight. Nothing warmed her heart quite deeply as seeing the way Seth looked over a cam after another under-the-table kick and grinned exactly like a ten-year-old boy caught sinning. He would make a terrific father, she thought. Just rough around, just rough around the edges to make it fun. He'd be the type to cart a child around on his shoulders to wrestle in the yard. She could almost see it. The handsome, dark-haired little boy, pretty rose-cheeked girl. You're in the wrong business, Phil told her as he pushed back from the table, considering loosening his belt. She blinked. God, danger, man! Very near your flesh. I am. You should own a restaurant. Any time you want to shift gears in that direction, I'll be first in line to invest. He rose and to make use of his cappuccino maker to compliment her dessert and answer the phone on the first ring. The sound of a husky female voice with a sexy Italian accent he raised his eyebrows. He's right here. Bill ran his tongue over his seat and held out the phone to Cam. It's for you, pal. Cam took the phone, and after one per sec sentence in his ear, almost wasted one. Hi, sugar. He said, searching for a name. Conveya. Because he indeed loved his brother, Phil tried his best to distract Anna. I just picked up this machine about six months ago. He told her, holding her chair so she would, would rise, perhaps move out of your shop. It's a beaut. Really? She wasn't the least bit interested in the working of some fancy coffee machine. Not when she heard, she saw smoothly. Cam had greeted his obviously female caller. When she heard him laugh, her teeth went on niche. It didn't occur to Cam to muffle his voice or sense of the content. He finally put a name with the voice. Sophia of the curvy body and bedroom eyes he was chatting lightly about mutual acquaintances. And she liked racing, all men are racing. It was hot, sleek, bullet in bed. No, I have to take a pass on the rest of the season this year. You don't, I don't know when I'll get back to Rome. You'll be the first bell. <laughs> he answered when she asked if he could, would call her when he did. Sure, I remember. Little Tertina near the trivia fountain. Absolutely. <laughs> he leaned back against the counter. His voice broke back memories. Not of her particularly, as he could barely get a clear image of her face in his head, but of Rome itself. The busy, narrow streets, the smells, the sounds, the rush, the races. What? Or a question about the Porsche jerked him back to the present time of life. Yeah, I've got a garage in nice until he trailed off. His thoughts scattered as she asked him if he would consider selling it. She had a friend, she told him. Carlo. Remember Carlo, didn't he? Carlo wondered if Cam would be interested in selling the car since he was staying so long in the States. I haven't thought about it. Sell the car? A little lance of panic stabbed him. It would be like a minute. He wasn't going back. Not just to Europe, but to his life. She was speaking quickly. Persuasively, her Italy and English mixing and confusing him. He had her number. See, you could call her any time. She would tell Carly he was thinking about it. That we're all missing Cam. Rome was so noisy without him. No say yo without him. She had heard he had said no to a big race in Australia. I was afraid it must be a woman holding him. And he finally phoned for Yes, no. He said it was one. It's complicated, sweetie. But I'll be in touch. Then she made him laugh one more time. Which was for suggestion on how they might send his first night back to Rome. I'll be sure to keep that in mind, darling. How could I forget? Yeah, shall. Philip was busily phoning milk and child with Trying with the air of desperate man to engage Anna in conversation about types of coffee beans. Even when the instinct of a survivor had already deserted the kitchen. Sat, simply sat, crumbling a hill of garlic bread for foolish who ate under the table. Ah, oblivious camera raised a suspicious eyebrow to cappuccino machine. I'll stick with regular coffee. He began to smile when Anna walked up to him. I remember your cannoli from. And air washed out of his lungs as she plowed a fist into his gut. Before he could suck it back in. 
She strode past him and else that was a slap of the screen door. What? What happened to Summer Cam Goog? Go that Phil. Jesus, what did you say to her? You're such a jerk. Phil muttered, definitely pulled the first cup. She looked really pissed. That's coming in stiff there. Can I try some of that joke you're making? Sure. Phil made a latte. Heavy on the milk. With the cam headed outside, Cam caught up the handle on the back, where she stood fuming. Her eyes folded over her. What the hell was that for? Oh, I don't know, Cam. For the hell of it, she whirled around the face of her eyes blazing in the starlight. Women are peculiar creatures. They get annoyed when the man they're supposed to be with flirts over the phone right in their damn face with some Italian bimbo the light on. But to his credit, he barely went, Come on, sugar. He broke off, unsure whether he was amused or fighting when she lifted a fist. Don't you call me Sugar. You use my name. You think I'm an idiot? Sugar, sweetie, honey pie. That's what you say when you can't even remember the name of the woman who's underneath you in bed. Wait a damn minute. No, you wait a damn minute. Do you have any idea how insulting it is to stand there and hear you make a date to meet your Italian squeeze in Rome when my lasagna's barely settled in your stomach? Worse, she thought. Much, much worse. He died a second after she'd been building foolish castles in the air of him with children, their children. Oh, it's mortifying, <laughs> infuriating. I wasn't making a date. He began and paused, fascinated. While stream of impression, Italian curses pulled out of her mouth. You didn't learn those from the grandparents. When she bared her teeth and hits, you couldn't stop smiling. You're jealous. <laughs> it's a, not a matter of jealousy. It's a matter of courtesy. She tossed her head, tried to calm down. She was only embarrassing herself more with the outburst, she realized. But by damn, she wasn't finished yet. You're a free agent, Cameron. And so am I. No pretenses, no promises, fine. But I won't tolerate you having phone sex while I'm standing in the same room. It wasn't phone sex. It was a conversation. The little Torina by the Terrio Fountain, she said going now. How can I forget? Yeah, you'll be the first. You want to know some Italian Zorino? Cam, that's your business. But don't ever do it in my face again. Took a breath and held up a hand before he speak. I'm sorry, I hit you. He gave his mood. Rough but becoming. No, you're not. Okay, I'm not. You deserve it. It didn't mean anything, Anna. Yeah, she thought wearily it did. Dirt meant a great deal. That was her own fault, her own small disaster. It was rude. Manners never were my strong point. I'm not interested in her. I can't even remember her face. Anna angled her head. Do you honestly think a statement like that goes to your credit? What the hell did you want them to say? He wondered with a quick, impatient hiss of breath. Sometimes he'd pose the truth, but it's your face, Anna, that I can't get out of my mind. She sighed. Now you're trying to distract me. It is is working. Maybe. Her emotions, she reminded herself, of her problem. Let's just agree that even casual relationships have lines that shouldn't be crossed. Wasn't sure casual was the word described what was between them. But at the moment, whatever made her happy, she knew, okay. Starting now, you're the only Italian bill bill in bimbo I flirt with. They're playing on spots there, made him win. It's terrific lasagna. <sighs> None of my other bimbos could cook. She slid her gaze to the water, backed his face, and cocked her head. Consideringly, Cam was pretty sure he saw the beginnings of humor in her eyes. We'd both end up in there. You don't know. But I don't mind if you don't. I suppose all in all, I'd rather stay dry. She glanced toward the house where, when music slipped through the windows and into the air, he placed the violin. That season. It was a quick and lively gig. One of the parents' favorites, the piano joined in, made him fall. And that's Philip. What do you play? A little guitar. I'd like to hear. In a gesture of peace, she held out a hand. He took it, drawing her close, taking her fingers through his lips. You're the one I want, Anna. You're the one I think of. But now she thought and let him slide her into his arms. Now was all that had had to matter. End of chapter 17.